Okay, hello friends, and welcome to a public shiur with Dr. Mark B. Shapiro, exploring the significance of Rav Yosef Kafech and the Yemenite experience. About our speaker, Mark B. Shapiro holds the Weinberg Chair in Jew Judaic Studies and the at the University of Scranton. The graduate of Brandeis, bachelor's and Harvard with a PhD, he is the author of numerous books, articles, and reviews, and is a popular scholar in residence at synagogues around the world. He regularly publishes widely read scholarly articles on the Sifrin blog. Last week, we had an extremely insightful members class with Dr. Shapiro, where we learned about Rav Shalom Isas and the Moroccan experience. We also had Dr. Shapiro with us on other occasions in the past, and his shiurim are always great hits. If you're not yet a member, I highly recommend to join and take full advantage of our content, such as uh, Dr. Shapiro's shiurim. And aside uh, from us, I also recommend to check out Dr. Shapiro's content directly uh, from his articles and books, podcasts, which are always very insightful. Uh, with that said, thank you all for being here live. And for all those who will be watching after, uh, Dr. Shapiro, thank you so much for being here with us. And the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I'm happy to be here for the second uh, week. Today, uh, we will be discussing uh, this individual, Rav Yosef Kafech, Kaf uh, as uh, it was pronounced. Uh, his dates are set 1917 to 2000. And uh, before we begin, I just want to read you something that if you Google... Uh, Rav Kafech, you come across this article called um, Harry Potter in the Land of the Dardai. So let me just, uh, the, the first um, paragraph of it, let me just give a translation. Now, I'm not a Harry Potter fan, so I don't know the, all these references, but uh, I'm sure most of you do. It reads as follows. One Shabbat, my children asked me why they can't do magic like Harry Potter. I answered them because their father is a Dardai. What's a Dardai? A Dardai is one who only comes close to a magician and immediately the magician loses all of his power and becomes like a regular person. Even if it's a great magician like Dumbledore, uh, his, all their, their father needs to come close to him and immediately he's a simple man from the street. If uh, his, their father just looks at Hagrid, the uh, Shomer Hakarkaot, I guess, I don't know what that means, the one who's in charge of the... Uh, the, the fields there, whatever. <laughs> I never read Harry Potter, so I don't know. And he becomes a katan, a mamash, just like a child. Even Lord Voldemort, that you don't say his name, can't come close to Abba. Um, therefore, it's not good to take a father on a trip to England, because if he just comes close to the Hogwarts School of Magicians, this school will become just like any other school. And it's also dangerous, because anyone playing Quidditch... Uh, will fall to earth, and uh, you won't be able to bring him to uh, Madame Pumpery's um, infirmary because she will also lose all her uh, powers. So uh, my children asked me, how can I do all these great and important things? And I answered them because I learned with a great teacher, Mari Yosef Kafach. He taught me all these things. And then the question was asked, can I learn them also? And I answered, yes, yes, indeed. So uh, what an interesting introduction to this figure we're going to look at. Uh, what does this have to do with Harry Potter? We'll see in a few minutes, because uh, the life of Rabbi Kafech takes us from old Yemen to the land of Israel, to one of the greatest figures of our time, one whose achievements are really incredible. He was um, the last representative of a glorious tradition of Yemenite Judaism, one that goes back a thousand years. And I mean it when I say he was the last true representative. He also stands out, I think, as probably the only rabbi in our generation, and I'm still including him in our generation, because he was in my generation, uh, um, the only rabbi in our generation who was regarded not only as a gadol Israel, a great halachic authority, a, a Torah scholar, a gadol, he was also respected in the world of academic Jewish studies. We have people like that, but in our generation, uh, he's the only one I think uh, who was. Uh, since Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg, I don't think there was another person who achieved uh, this respect in the academic world. Rav Soloveitchik was not involved in academic Jewish studies. Rav Nachman Rabinovich was not involved in academic Jewish studies. So uh, Rav Kafach is somewhat unique. Even after his passing, his followers have continued in his path. In fact, they've published, I believe it's now seven volumes of Masora of Yosef. That's uh, volumes dedicated to his ideas and his teachings and articles uh, in his uh, tradition. And a number of volumes uh, about him, uh, volumes of halachic writings, uh, other material. 
Before discussing Rav Kafech, I need, however, to tell you something uh, about a different individual, uh, and that is his grandfather, Rav Yechah because it's impossible to understand Rav Yosef Kafech without understanding his grandfather. In all of Rav Kafech's writings, this individual, Rav Yechia, is front and center, and everything Rav Kafech did, he viewed as a continuation of his grandfather's approach, although carried out, as we'll see, in a, uh, in a different fashion. Okay. In medieval times, the Ammonite scholars, Torah scholars, were great followers of the Rambam, both halakhically and also philosophically. When they are being persecuted, they turn to the Rambam. He wrote his famous letter to Yemen. After the Rambam's death, we're told that they added the Rambam's name to Kaddish. Rambam became the final halakhic authority in Yemen, the undisputed authority. Yet by the 17th century, new influences had entered Yemen. I'm referring in particular to Kabbalah, both classic Kabbalah as well as the Kabbalah of the Ari. This was to have a great influence on all aspects of Yemenite Jewish life, religious life, prayer, biblical commentaries, and even halakha. The notion that Yemenite Jews decide halakha based only on the Rambam uh, has not been true for hundreds of years, as Kabbalah became an important part of Yemenite Jewish life. In particular, uh, the Maharits, Rav Yichia Salih, was an important 18th century posseg, and he has many... Uh, volumes of halacha. He produced a siddur, which incorporated much of the Lurianic material, even though it still kept uh, old, Ye old Yemenite material. His siddur to this day is used by one group of Yemenites called the Baladi, which means the native or the indigenous. There's another group of Yemenite Jews known as the Shami, Shami meaning from the north, referring to Eretz Yisrael or maybe Syria, where they were influenced. And their siddur is the Sephardic version, but also uh, the complete adoption of uh, Lurianic uh, Kabbalistic ideas. Now, the Shami decided halacha based on the Rambam and the Shulchan Aruch, and the Baladi used the Rambam and the Maharits. But the idea that you would just decide based on the Rambam was not shared by any of them. And as I said, uh, this changed uh, in the 17th century, certainly by the 18th century, and there was an inner dispute in Yemen as to how much the Shulchan Aruch should be of importance, but that you decide based only on the Rambam, it didn't happen. And both of these traditions were influenced by the Kabbalah. Uh, regardless of uh, how much it influenced practical Kabbalah, they both were influenced by Kabbalistic ideas. And this is how matters stood to the beginning of the 20th century. It's then that a group of scholars led by Rav Yechia Kafech began nothing less than a reform, a reformation of uh, of Yemenite Jewry. Um, Rav Kafech was one of the great scholars in Yemen. He was in Sana'a. He served on the Beitin. He even served for a short time as the Chacham Bashi, which was the chief rabbi of Yemen. This was a position that the Ottoman Empire created so that there could be an intermediary between the community and the government. There was a Chacham Bashi in Turkey, in the land of Israel. Rav Yechia Kafech, what were his reforms? Uh, well, they were concerned with religion and education. For example, in his Beit Midrash, the focus was on Mishnah, with the Rambam's commentary, Talmud, Halacha. In the other Bate Midrash, people studied Midrash. They studied Zohar. Zohar was a major form of study. The study of Kabbalah was central to Yemenite religious life, not for Rav Yechiel He and his followers revived the study of the medieval Jewish philosophers that hadn't been studied in hundreds of years. I'm speaking of Sadiagon, Rabach Ibn Pakuda, the Rambam. And these were studied in Arabic. Again, this had not been done in literally hundreds of years. Rav Yosef Kafech wrote a few different memoirs. He describes how his grandfather, with him as a side helping him, a, a set out to find manuscripts. They even searched in Ginezot. After finding them, he found his, his manuscripts of old uh, texts of Rav Sadia, the Rambam, etc. After finding them, Rav Yosef and uh, Rav Yechia and the other followers would set about to copy the manuscripts. They didn't have copy machines or anything that we have today. They were also to get publications of classic uh, texts from Europe in both Hebrew and Arabic. In Germany at this time, there was a whole trend of scholars doing doctoral dissertations, publishing Arabic texts. So it's, uh, every single tractate of the Rambam's commentary in the Mishnah was published in Arabic, with a, often with a new Hebrew translation. Rav Yechiyakafech, known as Maria Yashish, the elder one, uh, also spoke out against the superstitions that were rampant in Yemen. 
Yemenite Jews, and I hope I'm not offending any Yemenite Jews listening to us, but they were uh, believed all sorts of things regarding demons, segulot, kameyot, evil eye. They lived in a world full of evil spirits that were all around you that can cause all sorts of havoc. Rav saw all this as a distortion of pure Judaism, of true Judaism, and he declared all of it nonsense. And he was not tolerant of popular beliefs. We today cannot appreciate what courage it took for him going alone almost, uh, the, alone among the senior rabbis almost, going against not just the other rabbani, but mainstream uh, Yemenite Jewish culture to reform it, to revitalize it and recreate it as it was before all these superstitions. I mean, they didn't view them as superstitions, the Jews of Yemen. They viewed them as Judaism. And he set out to uproot them. Uh, to uproot them. Uh, surprisingly, there would be a big backlash for this because he wasn't uprooting, in their eyes, superstition. He was uprooting firmly held uh, ingrained beliefs of the people. Soon, Rav Yechia was standing at the head of a real reformist movement. And we have to say reformist with a small r to be distinguished from what we think of reform uh, that comes out of Germany. Although I should say that uh, before Germany, you had in England, since you guys are from England, uh, reform synagogue from the Sephardic world, actually. Uh, you had reformist uh, ideas coming out of England. Uh, um, the classic notion, what does it mean a reformist movement? It means to get back to the original truth before it was distorted. And that was Rav Yechia's approach, to go back, bring back the Yemenite, medieval Yemenite intellectual tradition, which is a philosophical tradition, a tradition of great thinkers, before Kabbalah enters and becomes dominant. This Kabbalistic dominance leads to what Rav Yechia regards as the superstitions. It also led to Numin Hagin, changes in the Siddur, abandonment of the rationalistic outlook. It's hard to imagine, but the, uh, the Yemenite before, let's say, if you went back to medieval times, they were a center of rationalism. The Beit Midrash he set up in Sana was very special. And that, first of all, the, the, the new curriculum that I mentioned before, but it also trained its students to copy manuscripts, to be so frame, to make the fill-in cases, ink, parchment, to do shlita, nikor, mila. Just compare that with today, where uh, the average yeshiva bachor does not even know how to tie the tzitzit. So this, they were creating all-encompassing Jews. He also valued secular studies, although as we shall see later with his grandson, the word secular has to be put in quotes. Um, his major action, and the one which is the most controversial, was the absolute rejection of Kabbalah, including the Zohar. He saw it as a forged document which contains nothing less than Avodah Zarah, the Sfirot, Adam Kadmon, the sexual imagery, all the things that are known to people who study Kabbalah he saw as a divergence from pure philosophical, that is, pure Judaism of the of Sadia, the Rambam's version. He saw it as a foreign import that must be uprooted. And it's this which led to the great dispute in Yemen in the early part of the 20th century. Had he shown, had Rav Yechia shown respect for the Kabbalists, the Mekubalim, but argued that it was not his approach. As we've had many sages say, you know, Enli Esek Benistar, that I'm not involved in Kabbalah. But, uh, you know, that's, it's a holy thing, but I don't have any involvement with it. Had he done that, there wouldn't have been any problems. But he went further than that. He argued that the Kabbalists were distorting Judaism with their phony doctrines, and he was relying on the authority of the Rambam and the other medievals. Now, the ideas of the Kabbalists were that the Rambam didn't know about the Kabbalah. It was not revealed to him. And had he known about the Kabbalah, he never would have had his uh, rationalist doctrines. In fact, they even created a legend that the Rambam at the end of his life abandoned all of his ideas because he discovered Kabbalah. Rav Yechia was saying absolutely not, that the authority of the Rambam is enough to throw out these newfangled doctrines. The response to Rav Yechia and his followers was severe, and it caused a rift in the community. It led to the interference of the government, and Rav Yechia and his son Rav David were even put in jail. Rav David would die from the beatings that he received in jail. That is, he was let out, but he was so weakened through the beatings that led, we're told it led to his death. One night when Riecha was sleeping, his opponent set his house on fire. He got up in time to save his life. 
for some of the period that this was going on, this great dispute, this split in the Jewish community, not in Yemen, I should say, I said Yemen, but really in Sana, that was the center. And in the, the other towns were mostly simple people, but the center of Yemen, Torah Judaism, was in Sana. For some of this period, he was still on the Beitin. And he was serving together on the Beitin with people who so bitterly opposed him. But of course, this is not the first time that you have people serving on a bait tent who can't get along with each other, but they have to serve. Eventually, the Kabbalistic scholars of Yemen realized that they need to reach out beyond Yemen. And they wrote to the scholars of Eretz Yisrael, great rabbis there, to condemn Rav Kafach. And they did. They got this condemnation. And some even declared that he and his followers were heretics. Why were they heretics? Because they denied the authenticity and the holiness of the Zohar. Rav Kook didn't go that far, but he wrote a letter trying to convince Rabbi Yechach, a respectful letter, how he was misguided in his rejection of Kabbalah. Rav Yechia responds to these attacks with his own writings. And so you have a back and forth, and you can get these writings, uh, Rav Yechia's writings, the response to it. And this is how a matter stood until the great Aliyah after the establishment of the State of Israel. The fact that the rabbis of the land of Israel condemned Rav Yechia, who dies in 32, and the fact that they, the rabbis of Eretz Yisrael condemned Rav Yechia and his followers and condemned them and put them under cherem, didn't bother the followers of Yechia because they followed their teacher, whom they saw as the Gadol Hador, the leading sage of the generation. Rav Yechia's followers were known as the Dar Da'im. It's a, uh, it comes from the word Dor Deya. There's also a sage, by the way, and if you look in um, the story of Dimash Shlomo HaMelech, one of the sages that Shlomo was regarded as greater than is called Darda, but that's not where it comes from. It's uh, it's like a, um, not a distortion, but that's how the term has come down to us from the Arabic, from Dordaya, Darda'i. And they refer to their opponents as the Ikshin, namely the perverted, the distorted ones. Now, since the establishment of the state of Israel, the Darda'im have been a sort of secret society. And in fact, many of them, including the current leader, the current leader is uh, Rav Rasan Arusi, from Kiryat Ono, they really moved away from Yechia's unbending opposition to the Kabbalah, and now they're more tolerant of it. And the attitude would be more along the lines of Ein Liesek minister, that we're not involved with it, but they're not uh, saying that it's uh, it's a distortion or it's, uh, it's, uh, it's heretical or anything like that. Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef Kafach is 14 years old when his grandfather dies in 32. So he's quite young, but uh, he was he was basically raised by him, and he had a very close relationship to him, uh, as he speaks about in all of his writings that um, where he deals with his grandfather. That's when things got really ugly. Rav Kafach's father and mother had already died, and he had been raised by his grandfather. There was a law in Yemen that orphans were to be brought up as Muslims. So when uh, Rav Yechia Kafach died, an informer, a Jewish informer, one of the Ikshim, one of the opponents, told the government that Rav Yosef was, a, Yosef was an orphan. In order to save him from being removed from the Jewish community and forcibly converted, he was qu quickly married to his 11-year-old cousin, because married people could not be removed. A half year before that, he had already been put in prison on a false accusation that he had dug up and burnt the grave of one of the opponents of the community leaders. I, I don't know if this means he burnt the, the bones, but it was a completely false accusation. Incidentally, anyone who's interested in learning about the persecution that Rav, um, the, the followers of Yechia suffered, including Rav Yosef Kafech, Rav Kafech's granddaughter put out a video. It's called uh, Mori, or Mari is how they pronounce it in uh, Yemen. It's the whole story. I can't, it used to be on YouTube in like 10 um, sections. It's no longer on YouTube, but this tells the whole story and uh, about his life. Uh, in 1943, Rav Kafach emigrates to Eretz Yisrael. The route was from uh, Sana to Aden, then under British control, and to take a ship from there. Upon arriving in Eretz Yisrael, he learned in the Merkaz Arav Yeshiva and became close to Rav Kuk and the Nazir. Rav David Cohen, he was a Nazarite. Rav, Daz, Rav David Cohen was a Nazir par excellence, where Rav Kafach never made the dispute of Kabbalah personal. He first works as a silversmith, and in later years, he becomes very important in identifying Yemenite antiquities at the um, Israel Museum. In fact, there's an whole article about the contribution of Rav Yosef Kafach in this regard. He also wrote a volume 
about the life of Jews in Yemen, the different customs and practices. By the way, the fact that he was a silversmith is important to note because in, rabbis in Yemen would work for a living in all sorts of professions, including teachers. They were not paid for being rabbis. In 1950, he begins to work as a dayan on the Beit Din in Jerusalem. And 20 years later, he's appointed to the Supreme Rabbinical Court, Beit Din Agadol. Although he is as Maimonidean as you can be, maybe he wasn't a complete Maimonidean, uh, although it's hard to imagine that, but I, I mention this because he receives money for his Dayanut. He got a salary, which the Raman was opposed to. I assume he had an explanation as to why he was allowed to take this money and to not violate the Raman's position because uh, for Rav Kafach, everything is the Rambam basically. He went so far as to say that the Rambam had Ruach HaKodesh, and I don't know if he would ever violate the Rambam's uh, rule in a matter such as this. In fact, there's a legend that before he was appointed Dayan, he had to take an oath, a shivua, that he accepted the Zohar. But he was asked about this, and he denied it, said it never happened. By the time that uh, Rav Kafech had joined the Beit Nagado, he was the head of the Dardai which was fitting. After all, he was the greatest scholar in their camp, and he also had the lineage, the grandson of the founder. And as I mentioned, in all of his works, he mentions his grandfather with the greatest pride and respect. And yet he comes to realize that the opposition to Kabbalah is a lost cause. He never spoke publicly about it or wrote about it. And he didn't even answer a letter I wrote to him. I wrote him two letters. One he answered, the other one about Kabbalah, he did not answer. Other people who knew Rav Kafach better say that he would discuss it with them, but uh, for someone he did, who he didn't know, and in public settings, he didn't deal with it. A couple of years before his death, he was asked about Kabbalah. He said that if the Rambam is a Makubal, then I am a Kubal. And if the Rambam is not a Makubal, then I am not. Well, despite not speaking publicly about Kabbalah, anyone who reads his writings can see that he believes everything his grandfather taught. That is why he was subject and continues to be subject to great attacks by other Yemenite rabbis in the camp that we call the Ikshim. That is, we, he calls it that, and I just use the term, but they don't refer to themselves as this. They refer to themselves as the authentic Yemenite Jews. While Rav Kafech did not make the opposition to Kabbalah an issue, he continues the path of the Dardaim in other ways. Thus, he would decide how halacha based only on the Rambam. This is an innovation, but it's really not an innovation. It's going back to the pre-Kabbalistic influence in Yemen, where the Rambam is the sole authority in halacha that you decided. When he's on the Beit in Hagadol, he has to use the Shulchan Aruch also. But for his own community and for people who asked, he only decided based on the Rambam. Uh, by the way, you didn't only need to be a Yemenite. Anyone could join the community. I know an Ashkenazi who was part of the community, and he told me that when he would ask Rav Kafech uh, questions, he would decide based uh, on the Rambam's position. He has a student, I don't think he's related, of Aaron Kafech, who reports that uh, Rav Yosef was once asked, what is Minha Yerushalayim? Is, what is Minha Yerushalayim? Everyone you hear about, you know, there's different practices in Jerusalem. Rav Kafech replied, there's no such thing as Minha Yerushalayim. We have the Gemara and the Rambam, the Talmud and the Rambam. That's all you need. There's no Minha Yerushalayim. He had many interesting halachic views, which I don't have time to go into. One of them, just, just to, to throw it out there, because it's in the news, at least in America, he held that if a fetus has some defect, you can have an abortion until the time the baby is viable. There is, in fact, one area where Rav Kafach speaks halachically, and he expresses regret that the Jewish world does not hold like the Rambam. And that's with regard to forcing a man to divorce his wife if there's no reason for them to be together anymore. Um, some of you probably know that the Rambam held you can beat the man until he agrees to give the, the divorce, the get. Well, how can you do that? Uh, the divorce has to be given out of a man's free will. And the Rambam explains that uh, deep down, all Jews want to do the right thing. By us beating him, we're just uh, you know, letting him see the light so that he does the proper thing. Rav Kafech says that we would solve all these Aguna issues if we were allowed to do this. And he says that the, 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 they didn't, do not allow this today. In Israel, they have other things that take the passport away, but there have been people who have been put in jail even and haven't given the wife a get. That's because there's the, the but they didn't in Israel... Uh, are Hoshesh. They, they, they worry about the opinion of the other rabbis who oppose the Rambam in this matter. But Rav Kafach says if the rabbis from the earlier days, the medieval authorities, would see what our generation is like, they would agree with the Rambam. Because the modern situation has proven the Rambam correct. If today a woman demands a get, 
She can't live with her husband. And you refuse to force the man to give the get. You can be sure that she's still going to find another man to take up with, even if she doesn't get the get. With the Rambam's approach, we solve this because we force the man to give her a get. Now, the Rambam's efforts when it comes to Maimonides, his great contribution are found, first of all, in over 20 volumes of a commentary on the Mishnah Torah. You can always spot it in the Beit Midrash because it has this red uh, cover. It looks like this. Um, I think 20, uh, 24, 25 volumes. I forget the exact number. And then, of course, he has an edition of the Rambam's letters with his notes. He has a commentary, he has a translation from Arabic into Hebrew of the Guide of the Perplexed together with his commentary. And very importantly, he has a translation from Arabic into Hebrew of the Rambam's commentary on the mission, also together with his commentary. That work brought about a revival of the study of the Rambam's commentary on the Mishnah. It basically, it's in the back of the Gemara, but it, because the translation was not a good one, it had been totally forgotten and ignored. And uh, a new era of study of the Rambam's uh, commentary on the Mishnah began with Rakafak's publication. Much of it is based on the Rambam's uh, own handwrite, handwritten copy, which is in Oxford. Uh, we see from Rav Kafach that there are four separate editions of it, an unbelievably important work. If that's all he accomplished, it would have been an unbelievable achievement. Uh, he also wrote many articles elaborating and explaining the Rambam's uh, positions and matters. Um, Rav Kafach wasn't just a scholar of the Rambam. He was a real Maimonidean. How was this Maimonideanism seen? Well, to begin with, his writings are full of negative comments about various superstitions, including astrology. We all we also know that from the time he was young, he was interested in different areas of learning, in particular science. He has an article entitled, quote, Secular Studies, that is Secular Studies in Quotes in the Rambam. And he explains that according to the Rambam, which of course is his view as well, not only is science not secular, science is Kodesh Kodeshim, holy of holies. We are obligated, man is obligated to love God. You have to love the word your God. Well, how do you love God? We don't know God as an individual. Well, uh, what, for the Rambam, what this means is an intellectual connection to God, to understand as much about God as we can. But God's nature is unknowable. What can we know about God? Well, we can observe his actions. The heavens declare his glory. That's what uh, it says in the book of Psalms. So by studying God's creation. By analyzing, like just take the human eye and study what is the human eye, the brilliance of the creation, the more we study in science, the more we can recite that word, those words in Psalms, the heavens declare his glory. That is, uh, we see how amazing God's creation is, and that leads us to wonderment of God. Now, this is not secular. This is a mitzvah. In fact, in the Mishnah Torah, the first four chapters of the Sodeya Torah deal with the study of science, physics, and metaphysics, and philosophy. This is Kodesh Kadashi. We're obligated to do this. We also have to learn logic, astronomy, biology, zoology, physics, medicine. Uh, Rav Kafach notes that the sages describe Avram coming to recognize God by means of his uh, observations in astronomy. So what he shows here is that the Rambam expands what it means to study Torah. Rav Kafech gives us here and elsewhere an intellectual Judaism, not a Judaism for the masses. Since it's a religion of intellect, a great focus must be on issues of theology. Even the 13 principles of faith should be, should be understood as convictions. This is the Rambam's view, obviously, as well. But with under, that you understand these principles as convictions with understanding, not as a catechism. And of course, to reach the level of conviction, to understand it, you have to be educated in philosophy. How else can you understand what it means, the existence of God, the idea that God is, does not have a physical form, and other principles? This requires understanding of philosophy. And this approach of Rav Kafach explains why he translated and annotated so many of the important medieval philosophical works written in Judeo-Arabic, because that's where Judaism is to be found. In the philosophical tradition, he was continuing the path of his great teacher, his grandfather, resurrecting the old tradition, which is an intellectual Maimonidean type of religion. Now, granted, this is an elitist Judaism. Why do I say it's elitist? Because the masses are allowed to continue with their um, mistaken path. But the elite, who knows the truth, can practice a pure Judaism. 
purged of all the superstitions. His grandfather, Rav Yechich, he didn't see the, he saw the need to crusade for his views. Rav Yosef doesn't see this. He's not a crusader. He doesn't feel the need to crusade for his views or publicize them to the wider society. In fact, just like Maimonides, Rav Yosef Kafach writes in an esoteric fashion. You can see in certain places he's writing esoterically. He's speaking to his followers, those who shared his ideas. In fact, I would even go so far as to claim that the Rav Yosef is even more Maimonidean than his grandfather, Mari Yichia. I say this because the Rambam is allowed, it, it permits the masses to carry on with their superstitions as long as they don't affect ikarei muna, so uh, basic principles of faith. So, for instance, the Rambam says that you are not allowed to put holy names, names of angels and the like, on the inside of a mezuzah. If you do that, it's heresy. That is, you put them together with the psukim because of your uh, Kabbalistic, uh, you know, or your uh, superstitious ideas that these names are going to help you. That's absolutely forbidden. But the Rambam says you can put it on the outside. Why can you put it on the outside? It doesn't help, but but because it's on the outside, it doesn't affect the mitzvah. So if people want to put it on the outside, they can. The Rambam says that angels have no physical form, the concept of what an angel is. That's a different issue, what the Rambam means by that, but they have no physical form. But the Rambam says if the masses want to believe that angels have a physical form, they can, they can believe in that. Uh, so um, Rav Yosef's position was, as long as the masses are not involved in um, any sort of avodah zarah, if they want to believe in their various superstitions, that's their business. They want to walk around with red ribbons and they want to do all this sort of stuff. He doesn't need to, he doesn't need to be a crusader. Rav Yichia was trying to be a crusader. He was trying to bring Yemenite Jewry back to the path, the Maimonidean path, the rationalist path. No, Rav Yosef wasn't that. He was speaking in his Beit Midrash. Whoever came to his Beit Midrash, he speaks to them. Whoever reads his writings, he speaks to them. But he's not trying to create a revolution or a reformist movement. And in that way, he's really following the Rambam. The Rambam, when it came to Ikarei Muna, it was important for the masses to be brought into line. They can't believe that God is a physical form. The Rambam is a crusader for that. But if they want to believe in all other things, they're wrong. But okay, they, they can believe in it. Uh, at least that's my claim about Rav Yosef. Um, let me give you an example uh, where he uh, would express his views in his writings, or even orally. And now we have a good deal of oral teachings of his that have been published. For example, in one essay, he speaks against the practice of going to cemeteries and how it's forbidden to recite Tehillim there. The Rambam says uh, we should not go to cemeteries and that you remain quiet when you're there. And the only thing you say at the cemetery has to do with the dead. According to the Rambam, you're not allowed to involve yourself in divrei Torah at a cemetery. And reciting of Psalms, or Kafak tells us, uh, falls into the category of uh, divrei Torah. Now, obviously, this viewpoint is at odds with the common notion that the cemetery is a place of holiness, a place you go to pray. And we spoke last week about Morocco. Morocco uh, in Morocco, the, the cemetery becomes the holy place. They do the hilula there. People would live there for days. Uh, that's where all the prayers are. You sacrifice the animals there. I mean, the whole idea of the cemetery is to get close uh, to the dead person among the Hasidim. Uh, you go there and you pray at the grave because the Rebbe is going to be the intermediary for you. Uh, Rav Kafach, on the other hand, says that a cemetery is a place of tumah, of impurity. We don't go there for prayers or recite to Hillam or anything like that. Um, many people uh, do something special on a yurt site. They go to the grave. They say his prayers. Um, regarding this, Rav Kafach was asked, what do you do on a yurt site? And he says, we do like the Rambam says. So they, they replied, but the Rambam doesn't say to do anything special on this day. And Rav Kafach replied, that's exactly what the Ammonites do. Nothing. So the questioner said, you mean that one who dies is completely dead? That is no connection anymore? No neshama will have an aliyah, all these sorts of things? And Rakafach answered, quote, yes, completely dead. In other words, when someone dies, that's it. He's where he is and we're here. There's no connection anymore between him and us, between the, the, the one who passed and the world below. He's dead and that's it. Popular religion believes that you can connect with the dead. There's still ways that the dead are some part of the, some have some part in this uh, world that you can give them the Shaman Aliyah. Rav Kavach sees this all as superstition, that uh, once people have passed on, they are in a separate world. They have nothing to do with us anymore. And it's all superstition. And we hear this all the time. Uh, 
Zechuto, well, I'll get to that in a minute, but uh, the idea that uh, we can reach out and that the dead will come to dreams, all the things you all know about. I don't need to go into it. Uh, and Morocco, by the way, from last week, is probably the, the biggest example of this. It's ironic we're doing this the week after Morocco. In Morocco, uh, the, the saints, uh, you, you, you make a connection with saints and they become your saint and you become the evid uh, of, 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 of a deceased saint. Uh, you Even in Morocco, the tradition was you would address requests to saints. Saints. Uh, for of Kafka, there's all superstition. Uh, now, when it comes to the going to the cemetery to pray, there's also the issue of worship of the dead, Doresh Alamitim, which is not just a superstition, but regarding but comes into play with halachic problems. So we must keep away from this. Uh, Rav Kafka says, what possible purpose is there to pray or recite Tilim at the grave of the dead if not to see the dead as some sort of intermediary? And that's superstition. And he said there's an internal contradiction. On the one hand, people pray for the dead. But on the other hand, they ask the dead to intercede for us. If the dead needs our, if the dead need our prayers, how are they so powerful to intercede with God? People have prayers asking that the neshama be raised up. But then how can you ask the dead to intercede if they're so powerful that uh, why do they need our prayers to uh, be raised up? So it's all superstition for him. By the way, briskers also are great followers of the Rambam, never went to cemeteries. Rav Soloveitchik writes, the Rambam says not to go. Rav Soloveitchik writes that he himself did not go until after his uh, wife died that um, he thought he couldn't, psychologically, he couldn't uh, withhold, and he went. Uh, Rav Shach uh, lived in uh, Vilna, and uh, this is a story that Reichman said that uh, he would fly uh, Rav Shach from uh, B'nai Brak to Vilna to go to the Vilna Gons Kever, and uh, Rav Shach replied that he lived a number of years in Vilna, and he never went to the Vilna Gons Kever. He doesn't now need to go from her to Israel. Rav Kafech was given an honorary doctorate from Bar Ilan, and during the speech, he rebuked the organizers because on the invitation to the event, there was a Hamsa which is an ancient uh, amulet that uh, protects against the evil eye. Let me speak a little more about this. On his, uh, in his commentary on the Mishnah, Mikval, chapter 8, the Rambam comments that one who is tovel twice, that is one who goes to the mikvah twice, uh, let's see, of leprosy, whatever the reason you're going, uh, um, it's maguna, it's, um, it's uh, distasteful, it's improper. And uh, Rav Kafach says that it's not like people today who have tovel themselves many times, just like he says the reincarnation of, they're the reincarnation of Naaman, who to cure his leprosy is told by Elisha to dip himself seven times in the water. This I see as a strong attack against the Makubalim and others who uh, believe uh, Hasidim, that you have to go to the mikvah, all that. Uh, for the Rav Kafach, there are times, halachic, you go to the mikvah. Other than that, uh, th that's not something the Ramam tells you to do. So why would you do that? Uh, by the way, I don't think briskers also, even before Yom Kippur, I don't think briskers would go. Let me give you another example of the rationalist sentiment. He would never say, a common expression we'll see in rabbinic literature and often abbreviated, Zion Yud Ayin, Zahuto Yagen Aleinu. That is, his merit should protect us. The great rabbi's merit should protect us. He would never say this with Kafach. Instead, he would say, Zachut limud Torah to aleinu. That is, the merit of the learning of the Torah of this individual would protect us. Because he says that, because he didn't believe that we receive any heavenly benefit from the dead. We rise and fall, we stand before God on our own merit. Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't protect us. Yaakov Avinu doesn't protect us. Our grandfather or the Rebbe doesn't protect us. We approach God each as an individual. So, Zachut again Aleinu, no. Zachut, the, the merit of learning the Torah of this great rabbi can protect us. But the great rabbi doesn't reach down from heaven and protect us, like Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlav or anything like that. You know, Nachman said that anyone who goes to his kever, that uh, after 120, when you die, Rav Nachman will reach into the Gehenna and pull you out, uh, pull you up by your feet if you need it to, uh, as a merit of going uh, to visit his kever. I mean, for Rav Kafa, this is all nonsense, all superstition. Uh, what we achieve and where we end up after this life is only due to us, the work we put in to be better Jews. He was also opposed, you might find it interesting, to putting Bezrat Hashem at the top of letters. He must have come to this idea later in life, because in, I've seen some of the letters where he did put it on. But he have, even has an article, why you shouldn't put Bed Hay at the top of a letter. 
I mean, we're taught to put Bet, bet Hay, Bet Samach Dawid. He says that the practice is uh, only a few hundred years old and never was accepted in Yemen. I guess the way he was indoctrinated himself, so he did it for a time, but he stopped and he explains why. He says, if you write a letter, he says, if the content of the letter relates to mitzvot and other exalted things, God has nothing to do with it. It's your free will. And if the letter has something improper in it, can you say, you have Lashon Har in the letter, can you say that God is helping you do something improper? So he sees no point for this uh, Bezrat Hashem. It wasn't only with regard to views such as these that I've mentioned that he didn't always want to publicize his position. For example, he opposed Hakafot Shniot that are now popular in Israel. He didn't publicize it. He didn't want to go against uh, popular things. He wouldn't publicize view uh, public. He wouldn't make public his opposition to certain opinions of the Chazonish or the Maritz, that is Rivi uh, Chesalch. He said that to do so would simply bring him into controversy. It's enough that he tells his students. He doesn't need to be, be public about it. Uh, we further see Rav Kafak's views in his various introductions, and especially the notes he has to his books. So, for instance, if you look at the Ramam's commentary to Tractate Nazir, to chapter 2, uh, Mishnah 1, there's an argument there between the Tanakama and Rav Yehuda about uh, the view of Beit Shammai. The Rambam, in Rav Kachas, uh, understanding, shows no interest in understanding uh, Beit Shammai's view, since it's rejected. And therefore, it is not important to understand its logic and ramifications. As the Rambam says, that I'm not going to explain Beit Shammai's position because uh, we reject it. Sir so Rav explains that since it's rejected, we don't need to know it. And he says in Beit Shammai, the logic behind it, he says, quote, in our days, they would angrily reject this approach as Amaratsut. And those in the yeshivot, he says, Hamayushavim, Hamayushavim must mean those in the yeshivot would call it Barabatia, that this is a Barabat, Barabas in Ashkenazic. But our great rabbi has a different view. In other words, in the Lithuanian yeshivot, what's interested, what you're interested in is theoretical knowledge. That's what's prized most. And therefore, you want to understand Beit Shammai's position just as much as Beit Hillel's position. The fact that Beit Shammai is rejected, that doesn't take away from the fact that you want to have understanding of Beit Shammai's logic, and it's just as important as the logic of Beit Hillel. But in the Maimonidean tradition, and you see this has come from the Gonic tradition, uh, um, Torah study is closely joined with practical halacha. Therefore, you're wasting valuable time if you're trying to understand the logic behind Beit Shammai's opinion. We don't accept Beit Shammai's opinion. So we don't need to know the logic behind it and the implications. Rav Kafech was able to point to what the Rambam wrote. In one of his letters, the Rambam says, quote, that is the desired goal of the material collected in the Talmud has been destroyed and lost. That is, that is the pur purpose of the Talmud is for the study of practical halacha. And he goes on to say that uh, we have many people who act as if the disputes in the Talmud, that that's the whole point of the Talmud. And they focus on the various positions. But no, the only reason there are disputes in the Talmud is because we've, we've lost the actual tradition. And therefore, we need disputes to figure out what, what the halacha is. But once we already know what the halacha is, we shouldn't waste our time understanding um, rejected opinions. Uh, Ramam says, quote, the primary intention of Talmudic study is knowledge one must do and one must not do. This is not the position of Lithuania she vote. In another letter, the Rambam says that it's proper for the average person to devote himself exclusively to the Mishneh Torah and the Halachot or Yitzhak Afasi. Only if there's a disagreement between them do you go to the Talmudic Sugyot. So certainly you don't just concern yourself with explanations and disputes that have no relevance to practical halacha. For Rav Kathach, what's our guide? What's our authority? Truth. Not, uh, you know, numbers. You can say, well, there's a 50 Achronim who say this. In his commentary on the guide, Book 2, Chapter 15, commenting on the, the point there where the Rambam says that truth doesn't depend on how many people agree with it. Rav Kafach says that the post scheme of today should bear this in mind, since they feel the need to always cite opinion after opinion, source after source, to support their opinion. And Rav Kafach says, if your opinion is correct, if this is the proper reading of the, the Talmud and the Mishnah Torah, that's enough. You don't need to bring in uh, more and more authorities. Maybe he's directing this against Rav Vad Yosef. I don't know. Rav Kafak's form of Judaism is not an easy Judaism. It's easier to go along with what everyone else is doing. Yet this is not the way of the follower. This is not the way of a follower of the Rambam. A follower of the Rambam does not follow convention. His guide is truth. 
if 10 great rabbis hold an opinion and it's wrong, then it must be rejected. This is the Maimonidean approach, and this is the approach that guides their own, the guides of Kafach. If you're right, you're in the majority. The fact that 10 others disagree is irrelevant. It's also an approach that he had early on. He, they published a book called Sichot Kalim that was written when he was 17 years old. It was published a couple of years back, a few years back. And in it, he writes that, uh, what does it mean to have a Munat Chachamim? In the last chapter of Avot, uh, chapter six, it talks about that we need to have a uh, Munat Chachamim, faith in the sages. He says that what this means is that you have to attach yourself to the sages and believe what they tell you. But then he adds, Velo, do not believe Shtaminam the Gamri. Do not believe them entirely. That is, we listen to our great rabbis. We accept what they tell us, but we don't believe them entirely. What does he mean by that? If they tell you something nonsensical, we don't accept it. Even if it's our Rebbe, we're not Hasidim. If you're a Hasid of the Obav Rebbe, whatever the Obav Rebbe says, uh, you accept, even if you think it makes no sense, you accept it. We're not like that. And that's why he says that uh, in uh, that chapter of uh, Avot, it says what the Torah is acquired through Emunat Chachamim, and also pupul talmidim. What is pupul talmidim? Just say emunah chachamim. Why you had pupul talmidim? Because Rav Kafach explains pupul talmidim means that you have to uh, analyze, examine every matter that your rebbe tells you, and not accept it just because your teacher says it. So yes, we have emunat chachamim. We take what our rabbis tell us with a great deal of respect, but we don't accept it blindly. We examine it. We have pupul talmidim. We have to examine it, and if in the end it show it comes out. We're able to show that even what our great teacher said is incorrect. We don't accept it. That's the Maimonidean approach. With this approach, I think it's perhaps not surprising that although Rav Kafich was the greatest follower of the Rambam of our generation, there were a few times where he did not follow the Rambam. Because although he's the greatest follower, sometimes he too will conclude that uh, perhaps the Rambam's in error. We see that he showed intellectual independence. Uh, and in fact, regarding some of these examples, I think he would argue that it's not important what the Rambam said, but what he would say if he was alive today. So for an example, many of you probably know that in the Mishneh Torah, in Hilchot uh, Yisrodei Torah, I mentioned that the first four chapters deal with science, and one of the things it deals with is uh, astronomy. And if you look in, uh, I think it's chapter three, uh, the Rambam presents a Ptolemaic view of the world, that is, uh, which was the standard view in those in his day, that is the planets uh, all revolve around the Earth. The Earth is the center of the world, and uh, he has a whole conception of spheres, that the planets each have, they're part of a sphere, and they revolve around uh, the Earth, not the Copernican view that we know that um, everything revolves around uh, the Sun. In his commentary, Rav Kafach says that this astronomy that the Rambam gives us here um, it doesn't come as a Masora, a tradition from the sages. This is just the standard Greek astronomy. And this is important to stress, he tells us, that the Rambam is mistaken here, that this is the, he's relying on Greek astronomy, which is no longer accepted. And he feels that it's important to stress because if people actually believe that the Rambam's astronomy here is from Torah, that this is actually Torah, that this is a tradition of the sages, and they will now see that it's mistaken because we know that Ptolemaic astronomy has been mistaken, then they will be led to reject other aspects which are really are part of Torah. So in other words, if you tell people that uh, everything in the Mishnah Torah is, is actual Torah, is from the sages, and then we see Ptolemaic astronomy, which you know is incorrect, so of course we're going to throw that out. So if we're throwing this part of Torah out, well then who says that we shouldn't throw other parts of Torah out? So for Rakafa, he says it's very important to establish that uh, this is not Torah. This is just the Rambam using astronomy to make a, a larger theological point, but the astronomy is incorrect. It's not part of Torah. And don't think this means that uh, you can throw out parts which really are part of Torah. Rav Kafik also believed that the Rambam's reasons for the commandments, the Rambam offers many reasons for the commandments, which are not really very compelling today. They don't stand the test of time, that uh, Rav Kafik was not uh, tied to these reasons. In fact, he even, we're told that he even preferred, he, he never wrote this, but uh, one of his students mentions this. It's, uh, I, I found it amazing because uh, I, there's no reference at all in his writings to this, but he actually preferred Yehuda Levi's perspective. That the mitzvot are special in and of themselves, not necessarily tied to any philosophical or historical reason that we can offer. 
Mishael Ibbis, I should just point out, thinks that this is really the Ramam's position, that this is the highest level, that he thinks that all the reasons the Ramam's gave short commandments are really on a low level, designed for the masses, uh, but uh, the highest level is simply that the mitzvot uh, are to be done in and of themselves without any concern for this. But uh, Rav Kafach didn't he understood the Rambam in its simple fashion that the uh, this is uh, the reasons for the commandments, but he he did not buy he did not buy the reasons, and the reasons are tough today. If you read the Rambam's reasons for commandments, health related reasons, others, uh, there Rav Soloveitchik also has a piece uh, about the command about the reasons for the commandments that uh, some have argued that uh, you know the Rambam is. Um, understood that his reasons for the commandments were only provisional. He's only offering for his generation. Future generations can offer other reasons for the commandments. However you look at it, uh, Rav Kafech did not buy into these reasons. As I said, the Judaism of Kafech is not an easy Judaism. And I'm not here to say that everyone should adopt it. Lock, stock, and barrel. We have other traditions as well. We can't deny that the capitalistic approach has also contributed a great deal to Judaism as we know it. Is anyone prepared in our community to get rid of a Dodi? You know, because uh, we're not interested in Kabbalah. Kabbalah is part of traditional Judaism today. But I would say that even for those who have a different approach to Kafach, it's important to be aware of his contributions and his importance. Especially, I say this, because uh, recent years have seen a proliferation of Jewish superstition to levels never seen before. At least I can't recall ever seeing it. Now, this sort of thing um, there's always, has always existed, but not to the level and uh, the breadth it is now. In America, I can tell you, I don't know what it is in England, you have these big Jewish newspapers now, and you'll see newspaper ads all the time for holy men, or holy men in quotes, uh, who come to, um, come to town, come to the five towns, come to New York area you know, uh, available for appointments. And these holy men will, they can read your face, they can read your palm, they can look into your soul, they can give special brachot for health and parnasa. Of course, as long as you give them a suitable donation. Uh, without that, then uh, you can't be sure that the bracha will come true. I'll just add, Derech uh, Agav, that the Ravitsa Kaduri, who was a real makubal, said that uh, no real makubal charges people money in order to help them. So as soon as you see a Makubal coming to town, I assume they come to London as well, and uh, you have to give a very nice donation before you can go in and meet them, before you get the Baracha, you can be sure he's not a real Makubal. But this whole notion, there was a person who came to my area, I didn't even know this was such a concept that he, uh, uh, you can go to him and uh, he had holy water. Something with the Baba Sali, he brought holy water to America. Now, I don't even know that Judaism had such a notion of holy water. Uh, so this is... Um, I mean, the, these um, these uh, superstitions are running rampant now in our communities. Well, for those who are turned off to this, it's important to remember that there's another Jewish tradition, one that has nothing to do with evil eyes, amulets, holy men giving blessings for worldly success. It's a Judaism that focuses on the Torah, on the words of the sages, a Judaism that tells us to obey mitzvot because they're the commands of God, not because they are sigulot, that are going to bring us all sorts of goodies. It's a Judaism that is centered on doing God's will, the Shema, you know, being an Eved Hashem because God commanded it, rather than trying to figure out how uh, God and Judaism can best serve us. Instead, we try to figure out how we best can serve God. And fulfill the mitzvot. Uh, I guess we can remind us of uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, a famous uh, statement, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. So ask not what Judaism and Torah can do for you, ask what you can do for Judaism and, and Torah and the Kaddish Baruch Hu. And it's a completely different way, a different understanding of what it means to be a Jew. And um, and when you have a Kafka's approach, I would say that next time you get that email, which the, you can come together for the to, to bake the chal, the shlisel chal, or come together and do this, and say the amen, so all these things, all these various uh, practices that the masses do, rather than uh, acting like Rav Yechia and uh, sending an email to the whole email list, how this is nonsensical and this is foolish, I think Rav Yosef's approach is that uh, for those people, who are at that, they haven't yet been able to emancipate themselves and rise to the level of a pure form of Judaism. If this is what uh, helps them, you know, keep uh, the Torah and mitzvot, if this is where they are, okay. And for them, that's okay. But for us, those who uh, are, have been able to move beyond this and see what Torah is all about, we understand that there's a higher way. There's a way of uh, which uh, 
which uh, takes us back to the Rambam and, uh, you know, doesn't involve ourselves in astrology and amulets and incantations and all this stuff. It involves ourselves in Torah. And, uh, and that's the approach of Yosef Kafach. So I think I've gone long enough here, and I will uh, glad to take the comments and questions. Uh, um, Uh, Yanni yeah, says he's been taught. I don't know what he's been taught, but um, I, I think he's saying uh, that. I see uh, that uh, there's a shear by Rabbi Dweck about um, uh, Rabbi Kafech's Shubah about uh, invoking God's name on letters. Okay, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, I recommend listening to that. Uh, thank you, Claudia, for your uh, comments. If anyone wants to orally wants to say something or write it, I'll stay for a few more minutes. Uh, Sina? Um, it's possible for me to share all the sources in the Rambam I mentioned. Uh, you, sort of, you can email me or you can have uh, the people in charge here email me and I'll send it and they can send it out. I know last week, uh, Rabbi Levy, we had an interesting discussion. So I sent out, uh, I think they sent out the uh, the article dealing with Moroccan halacha and the order of the um, the uh, Hadakat Neirot and the Berachot. So I can do that uh, as well with any sources in the Rambam. Hacham Mark, Sina here. I wanted to say, first of all, thank you so much for another phenomenal shiur about a uh, much-loved Hacham uh, in the Chabara community. So it was uh, beautiful oh, to hear so much about his life and work. Yeah, so thank you, you again. Um, question I had was, who would you point to as some of the Hachamim in our generation right now, who you see may not be exact copies of Mori Kafech, but uh, represent some of his values um, and, and that uh, classical Sephardi approach? Well, I think Rav Arusi, uh, his Talmud, uh, is that uh, there aren't uh, many. I mean, I uh, you have uh, you have Chachamim, but not uh, of the level of Kafach that I would say Gedolei Hador. But uh, you have uh, the, I, I know Rabbi Mark Angel and uh, Rabbi Machon Shilo. I don't uh, not a follower of Machon Shilo, but uh, the Rabbi Machon Shilo, I forget his name escapes me now, but he. Rabbi uh, in many ways, he's a follower of Rav Kafech. I have to say that there aren't, other than in the uh, the Yemenite community, Rav, other than the Yemenite community, I don't really see anyone following in uh, his path. Rabbi Shelat, let me say Rabbi Shelat, probably, although he's more of an, a scholar as opposed to a leader, but uh, uh, I, I don't know if we have today uh, any figures. Uh, maybe Rav, Rav Suriel in Israel. I'm not sure if there's any. There's certainly no one at the top level, like Rav Kafech was a great mosaic. Uh, Robert asks, was he against Mourner saying Kaddish because it's Kabbalistic? Well, Mourner's Kaddish is not Kabbalistic. Uh, I mean, it's a minhag. Um, it um, it goes back to the Ashkenaz, uh, but it's not it's not Kabbalistic per se. You can add Kabbalistic things in it, but Mourner's Kaddish is simply, it's an acknowledgement, a recognition of God's uh, justice, God's God running the world. Uh, it doesn't deal in the Mordor's Kaddish does not deal with uh, the Neshamot and raising them up or anything. Uh, uh, what was Rasad with Kafka's goal when translating Rasad Yavon's commentary to Sefi Yitzira? Well, it's not he, from that work. It's not a Kabbalistic. Uh, they don't see it Kabbalistically. There's the issue with Rakafach, it's it's uh, it's a familiar problem that uh, you wish there'd be someone at his level carrying on this tradition, uh, but there isn't. And I think maybe that's because, uh, if you can speak to, from a providential sense, is that really we don't live, unless you move to Jerusalem or Kiryat Ono and start going to a, a shul, a Dardaim shul, we live in communities in which uh, we have all different traditions. So uh, I, I don't think that uh, it really makes sense. Uh, there's someone in Israel who's putting together a, a sidur, like a, like a, just a, a Rambam type of sidur. But that's not how we live. So I think it's important that we take from all the traditions, uh, benefit from all of them, but simply to become, I don't think it's realistic that we can, uh, even if you're inclined to this, to just remove Kabbalistic ideas in the prayers and everything. You know, that's what our tradition is. And Rav Kafech never told people to do that. Uh, but he, all he did in his community, he wanted to carry on the Yemenite tradition, the original Yemenite tradition, but he never was telling other people that uh, you should change your Nusach or anything like that. 
but I, I, I do think that uh, his ideas about superstition are certainly very valuable, and that's uh, a battle worth fighting, uh, that I will say. Okay, well, uh, well, thank you all. Uh, it was a pleasure, and uh, uh, much success uh, on this these great programs you do, and uh, really the revitalization of uh, learning in the Sephardic community of the great Chachamim. So uh, go from strength to strength, as we say. Thank Goodbye, you so everybody. much, Chacham. We're very excited to have you many more times with us. Well, let's have everyone.